Welcome back to Student to Stud. In this episode, we will go over tibial plateau fractures and everything you should know as a medical student. I'm very excited to discuss this topic with you, so without further ado, let's get started. Here's the basic outline on what we'll cover in this presentation. Time for the first case. What do you see? We have two views, AP and lateral of a right knee, demonstrating a non-displaced lateral tibial plateau fracture. How would you treat this fracture? This fracture was treated with a lateral buttress plate. What's the typical presentation for someone that sustains a tibial plateau fracture? The mechanism of injury to sustain a tibial plateau fracture consists of a force directed varus or valgus with or without an axial load. These fractures are sustained when the femoral condyle causes shearing and compressive force onto the tibial plateau. Here's an example of the femoral condyle causing an axial and varus compression onto the tibial plateau resulting in a lateral split tibial plateau fracture. Younger patients will most commonly have an isolated tibial split fracture as their subchondral bone is able to withstand the compressive forces from the femoral condyle. Younger patients will usually have ligamentous injuries. As people age, the tibial bone becomes osteopenic and can no longer withstand the compressive forces from the femoral condyle and will result in a depression of the tibial plateau with or without split. Elderly patients will have a lower chance of ligamentous injury than the younger patient. The most common tibial plateau fractures are your lateral tibial plateau fractures followed by bicondylar tibial plateau fractures and the least common are pure medial tibial plateau fractures. Just like all physical exams, your patient will complain of severe pain, swelling, and inability to bear weight. You must evaluate for signs of open wounds, crepitus, instability, and deformity. You must ascertain the amount of energy that was associated with the energy. Was this a high energy injury or was this a low energy injury? This will help with your level of suspicion for other injuries that are associated with these fractures. You need to perform a thorough neurovascular exam. Do they have symmetrical pulses? If you're unable to palpate the pulses, are the pulses dopplerable? If there's any question about the peripheral pulses, you should perform ABIs. ABI stands for ankle brachial pressure indexes. If the ABI is less than 0.9, you need to perform further imaging studies by either ultrasound or arterial imaging, such as angiography in the operating room, arteriography, or a CT angio. You need to make sure the vascular team is aware of this patient and get them involved early. Schatzker 4 is defined as a medial tibial plateau fractures and have a high incidence of vascular injuries. These types of tibial plateau fractures are usually due to high energy injuries, which can lead to damage to the popliteal vessels and damage to the peroneal nerve. Do you know how to perform ABIs? The equation is displayed on the top right of the screen. You want to take the highest systolic blood pressure between the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial artery of the injured extremity, and divide that by the higher brachial systolic blood pressure between the right and left arm. If the fracture extends into the diaphyseal region or involves both sides of the tibial plateau, you need to have a heightened awareness for the possibility of compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is caused from the hemorrhage and edema that occurs with this fracture. It can occur also by reperfusion if there is vascular injury. The artery associated with compartment syndrome in this region is due to injury to the anterior tibial recurrent artery. Compartment syndrome can be remembered by the six P's, pain out of proportion, pain with passive stretch, paresthesias, paralysis, pulselessness, and poikothermia. Meniscus injuries are quite common with tibial plateau fractures, occurring approximately half of the time. Lateral meniscus injuries are more common than medial meniscus injuries. This makes sense as lateral tibial plateau fractures are more common than medial tibial plateau fractures. Lateral meniscus injuries are associated with a split depressed lateral tibial plateau fracture in which the articular surface is depressed one centimeter. There is an 83% rate of lateral meniscus injury when the lateral tibial plateau is depressed greater than six millimeters and widened greater than five millimeters. Medial meniscus injuries are associated with medial split tibial plateau fractures. ACL injuries are common with type 4 and type 6 tibial plateau fractures. 
the PCL, MCL, LCL, and posterior lateral corner structures can be injured as well. Can you name the posterior lateral corner structures? The structures are the LCL, popliteus, popliteofibular ligament, the lateral capsule, the arcuate ligament, the fibulofibular ligament, the biceps femoris, the IT band, and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. Tibial plateau fractures are known to have other associated fractures. Other associated fractures can be the proximal fibula, the tibial tubercle, and the intercondylar eminence. Let's now turn our attention towards some pertinent anatomy that you should be aware of. The medial tibial plateau is stronger, concave, and distal to the lateral tibial plateau, which is weaker, convex, and proximal. The medial tibial plateau is responsible for 60% of the weight bearing through the knee. The average tibial slope is 10 degrees in oriented posterior and inferiorly. If you are evaluating a patient with a tibial plateau fracture and you do not have access to a CT scanner, you want to obtain an x-ray that is directed 15 degrees caudally with the leg in full extension. This view will give you the ability to assess the tibial articular surface. The intercondylar eminences are where the ACL and PCL attach distally. The tibial tubercle is the distal attachment to the patellar tendon. The pes incisoriasis is where the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus attach on the anterior medial surface of the proximal tibia. You may be asked on rotations what pes incisoriasis is referred as. It is referred as goose foot. On the opposite side of the tibia, is Gertie's tubercle, which is the insertion site for the iliotibial band. When you evaluate someone with a tibial plateau fracture, you should obtain the knee trauma series of x-rays, which consists of five radiographs, an AP, a lateral, two obliques, and a 15 degree caudal view. The oblique views help determine the amount of depression, and the 15 degree caudal view gives you the ability to assess the tibial articular surface. In practice, you may not need to obtain all of these x-rays as most tibial plateau fractures are best assessed with a CT scan. CT scans are able to define the fracture better than an x-ray and determine the amount of depression. CT scans have been shown to change operative planning 60% of the time. Your CT scan must be 2 mm cuts to allow for optimal sensitivity and specificity. CT scans can detect lipohemarthrosis, which can indicate an occult fracture. Lipohemarthrosis is defined as a collection of fat and fluid within the joint. On CT scan, you will see three layers. The top layer will be the fat layer, the middle layer will be the serous fluid, and the bottom layer will be the cellular components of blood. On rotations, if you ever aspirate a knee and you see fat globules, that may indicate an occult fracture. Let's now turn our attention towards the classification that is used to define tibial plateau fractures. It is known as the Schatzker classification and broken down into six subtypes. Type 1 is a lateral split. This is the most common pattern in the younger patient as the cancellous bone is hard and can still prevent depression. Type 2 is a lateral split with depression. This is the most common in the older population as the cancellous bone is weaker and cannot withstand the forces from the femoral condyle. Type 3 is a pure depression of the lateral plateau and considered a fragility fracture equivalent. Type 4 is a medial plateau fracture. This type is equivalent to a knee dislocation. It has the highest association with injury to the neurovascular structures and ligaments. Type 5 is a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture. Type 6 is a disassociation of the metaphysis and diaphysis. Types 1 through 3 are considered low energy variants, whereas types 4 through 6 are considered high energy variants. There's another classification system known as the Moore classification, but it's not high yield enough to discuss during this lecture. We will discuss surgical indications on the next slide, but for those where surgery is not indicated, the patient will be placed in a hinged knee brace. Their weight bearing will be restricted with gradual progression as radiographic healing is seen. Patient's range of motion will slowly progress with the goal to reach 90 degrees of flexion by four weeks. In the past, tibial plateau fractures were treated with a cast for one month, and those patients experienced extreme stiffness. So what are the surgical indications for tibial plateau fractures? You will likely be asked these indications while on rotations. 
The surgical indications are articular depression greater than 3 mm, condylar widening greater than 5 mm, varus valgus instability greater than 10 degrees, all medial plateau fractures, all bicondylar fractures, and open fractures. I remember these indications as remembering the numbers 3, 5, 10, and that if it involves the medial plateau, it requires surgery. The goal of surgical fixation is to restore the articular surface and restore the alignment. We will now discuss different surgical constructs that can be used to treat tibial plateau fractures. First, external fixators can be used if the soft tissue swelling is too severe for definitive internal fixation. External fixators allow for the soft tissue to resolve prior to definitive fixation. External fixators work by using continuous longitudinal force to bring the fracture fragments closer together. This phenomenon is known as ligamentotaxis. Ligamentotaxis requires intact soft tissues to allow for distraction of the tibia. You want to place your pins on the anterior femur and tibia. For tibial plateau fractures that require external fixators prior to internal fixation, you want to obtain the CT after the application of the external fixator. The next construct that we'll discuss is using an external fixator with fixation of the articular segment with a screw or wire. When you place your screw or wire, you need to be at least 14 millimeters from the articular surface. This keeps your screw or wire away from the synovial recess to avoid contaminating the knee joint. Open reduction and internal fixation will be the workhorse surgical approach for definitively fixing tibial plateau fractures. Restoring the articular surface is the strongest predictor for long-term outcomes. So the first thing you need to do when treating these fractures are to restore the joint surface. You then want to fill the metaphyseal bone void with bone graft if there's bony depression. You can use calcium phosphate bone graft which has the best compressive strength. You may be asked which type of bone graft has the highest rate of subsidence and drainage, which is calcium sulfate. I remember this by sulfate sucks since it subsides if used. In order to make sure the joint stays reduced, you will commonly see screws used to obtain absolute stability. As a medical student, you need to know that most commonly a buttress plate will be used. These plates can be non-locking or locking. Locking plates create a fixed angle construct. Locking plates are more expensive, but they're indicated for comminuted fractures and osteoporotic bone. You can use one plate or two plates depending on the fracture. If you use two plates, you want to make sure that your plate ends are not at the same level to avoid a stress riser. Postoperatively, you will place the knee in a hinged knee brace with passive range of motion. The patient will have restricted weight bearing for 8 to 12 weeks. There are two main surgical approaches that we will discuss. To the right is an illustration to help you visualize the surgical approaches as I discuss each approach in detail. The first surgical approach that we'll discuss is the anterior lateral approach. In this approach, the surgeon will feel for Gertie's tubercle to help guide their surgical incision. In this approach, the capsule of the knee will be incised in the superior joint service and lateral meniscus will be inspected. The tibialis anterior origin will be detached to allow visualization of the proximal tibia and allow for placement of the plate. The next surgical approach we will discuss is the posterior medial approach. The dissection will be between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the medial aspect of the proximal tibia. You need to be aware of the neurovascular structures that lay anterior to your surgical dissection. These structures are the saphenous nerve and the great saphenous vein, also known as the long saphenous vein. As you continue to your surgical dissection, you will encounter the pes psoriasis, which contains the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus. You have two choices when you get to this stage. You can incise the pes psoriasis, or you can reflect these tendons posteriorly. Once you are on bone, you will be able to see the superficial medial collateral ligament, which inserts approximately 6 centimeters distal to the joint line. There are several well-known complications with tibial plateau fractures. Infection is a major concern as the soft tissue is susceptible to breakdown. It is imperative to delay open reduction and internal fixation until the soft tissue has time to heal. This is usually indicated when skin wrinkles return. 
Types 5 and 6 have a high rate of infection. Some risk factors for infection are open fractures, smoking history, compartment syndrome requiring fasciotomies, and fractures that require two incisions with two plates. Post-traumatic arthritis is common and associated with the articular surface not being anatomically reduced or if there's malalignment. In addition, the cartilage is damaged from the initial injury which can lead to arthritis. Arthrofibrosis can occur if active motion is not performed postoperatively. We already discussed the risk of developing compartment syndrome and having vascular injuries, but I wanted to reinforce these complications as these can be devastating to the patient if missed. Malunions can occur. Nonunions are rare but can occur. If this happens, you would treat them with bone graft and possibly revise their open reduction and internal fixation. The peroneal nerve can be damaged. Last but not least is the risk of developing a DVT as patients have extended times with impaired mobility. You need to be aware and order a DVT ultrasound if you have any clinical suspicion of this potentially life-threatening complication. Don't be fooled and believe that they are just having swelling due to their injury. We will go over one more case before jumping into some pimp questions. How would you read this x-ray? We have two views, AP and lateral, of a right knee demonstrating a lateral split depressed tibial plateau fracture. A CT was performed which allowed better appreciation of the amount of depression of the articular surface of the tibia. This fracture was fixed with a buttress plate on the lateral tibia. This was a pretty complex case. Let's now jump into some pimp questions to finish off this lecture. Question 1. What is ligamentotaxis reduction? It's continuous longitudinal force causing a distraction to bring fracture fragments closer together. What side is more common to have an associated meniscal injury? Lateral. What artery is responsible for compartment syndrome with tibial plateau fractures? Anterior tibial recurrent artery. How much saline do you have to load into a joint to be 95% confident that there is not a traumatic arthrotomy? 150 cc's. Is the medial tibial plateau convex or concave? It's concave and distal. What are the components that make up the pes and psoriasis? The sartorius, the gracilis, and semitendinosus. What is the classification for tibial plateau fractures? Schatzker. What is the most common tibial plateau fracture? Type 2. What are the surgical indications for tibial plateau fractures? Articular step-off greater than 3 mm, condylar widening greater than 5 mm, varus valgus instability greater than 10 degrees, all medial tibial plateau fractures, all bicondylar tibial plateau fractures, and open fractures. What type of tibial plateau fracture is most commonly associated with an ACL injury? Type 4 and type 6. What kind of plate is commonly used to fix tibial plateau fractures? A buttress plate. What tibial plateau fracture has the highest incidence of vascular injury? Type 4. Remember, this is equivalent to a knee dislocation. What two tibial plateau fractures have the highest incidence of compartment syndrome? Type 5 and type 6. How far away should you keep your wires from the articular surface? 14 millimeters. And that's all for tibial plateau fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.